show had a style to it that was unique and that just clicked and worked. I mean, I personally, I remember at the time, I didn't like the slow motion and the action scenes because I wanted to see the moves and everything. But uh, that, I guess that was Jerry Thorpe's decision and, and uh, it, it worked for the show. We um, graduated the slow motion. We changed speeds during shots to create different impressions. We played with that a lot. And that was new. I, I can't remember. It's only because the focus puller was a genius. The slow motion uh, did two things. One, it was a, a wonderful effect. And the other thing is it calmed the FCC because even though it extended the length of the time that we were fighting, and that was something we had to deal with. But what it did was it made things seem softer. It, it didn't have that smack of violence about it. Slow motion, right? You had to uh, bang, and then the guy gets hit right after that. The hair, the body, and the rocks, and the falling, and all oh, the expression starts. It won't work. I said it will. Master, of man's roots, which is the stronger? It is a Shaolin belief that the paternal line controls. We developed the flashback sequence cinematically for this reason. You have a character who has several lives. He has his present tense life. And he has certain things that he must deal with in a parallel way. How are you to do this dramatically? Because if you do it in a linear fashion, in other words, if you do the complete Chinese sequence, and then you take him to the West, those, those very specific pieces of those lessons, which he has to apply to the present, would probably be lost to the audience. Flashback. There's a, no one ever done this before. People are drive, you're crazy. You're watching, watching, you finally follow the story, and then cutting, and all of it, bang, uh, 30 years ago. <laughs> will never work. I say it will. Close your eyes. What do you hear? Of all the things we've written, and we've written some stuff that we like, we never would have known that Grasshopper would be the thing that people would remember. Do you hear your own heartbeat? No. Do you hear the Grasshopper, which is at your feet? And now we just picked Grasshopper. We could have said Japanese beetle. Could have said you know, cockroach. We cockroach. decided against cockroach, because it's not a good reference. Yeah. Old man, how is it that you hear these things? Young man, how is it that you do not? My memories of how special that show was going to become came when the guy who was sort of the mayor of the Warner Brothers lot at that time took me around to the back lot and showed me the Camelot Castle. And it was just... It was, oh my God, there's our, there's our Kung Fu temple. The art director, uh, Eugene Lurier, his talents were unending. He converted a medieval castle that had been built for Camelot on the back lot uh, into a, an A.D. second or third century Shaolin Monastery for a buck and a quarter. He cannibalized every scene doc in the industry. It was amazing to watch the elements he brought in and the truckloads of stuff he brought in. And uh, he, he made that castle into a believable Shaolin Monastery. And the scale was enormous, so it wasn't easy. And when I came from the water to breathe the last time, Shang Tzu, the magician, was not there. And the scroll of Zhuangzhou? It, too, was not there. You were deceived? It was interesting. It was an unusual environment. And, of course, they had it all set up with racks and racks of candles, and they pumped a lot of smoke in there, which at the time they were using um, 
I think it was like frankincense, you know. And so you had these little uh, smoke pots, things that were going, and, and they were uh, filling the air. And so anytime anybody ever walked on the set, even when you yourself walked on the set, the voices became hushed because it was very much like a, a monastery set, and it was large, voluminous space. So it's a very interesting place to work, certainly. Good afternoon, grasshopper. Oh, he'll get his cut. When? When I'm ready. One of the great things about Kung Fu is that it had this incredible A-list of guest stars, you know, that were stars then and that became stars later. First of all, you had people like John Saxon, William Shatner, um, Tim Matheson, okay, who were well established at the time. But Harrison Ford, um, Jodie Foster, they essentially, you know, made their debuts on television. So it was a breeding ground uh, for A1 talent, and it was also just surrounded by A1 talent. I mean, in front of and behind the scenes. They didn't settle for less. People wanted to do the show because uh, it was unique. It's as simple as that. Uh, yes, it was. It was fairly easy to cast people that normally wouldn't do uh, serious television. What you doing up here? Listening. I was just practicing, waiting for the stage to come. Is what you play a lute? No, it's a mandolin. And it's called a plectrum. It makes a sound like running water. Well, I remember Jodie Foster the moment that I saw her. I knew she was going to be a big star and it's also one of my favorite segments. And she was a darling. I mean, she was about this tall. And she had all of her acting mojo together. Uh, I just loved her. They call me Lethe, but my real name is Miss Lethia Patricia Ingram. My real name is Kwai Chang King. The scenes with her and David Carradine are, are really, really very special. They're, they're just, uh, you know, two people relating on this magical level um, that you just, you just love, you love watching them. And, and shots of Jody walking down this deserted western street where the camera's very high and this lonely little child, you know, sort of caught, in, caught on the horns of a dilemma. It's a, you know, it's a, a lovely image too. I lost my hat at the beginning of the first segment that Cam was the coordinator on. So that for anybody that wants to know, if I'm not wearing a hat, then it's real kung fu. I, I marked several things like that. Uh, when Bruce Lee died, I changed the color of the shirt from brown to saffron. Um, and the other way that you can tell when a, a segment was shot is look at the length of my hair, because I just simply grew my hair for, for the four years that I was involved. We had a restaurant there for 34 years in Panorama City in the San Fernando Valley, and, and Philip uh, was, you know, he was the front man, and of course I did all the grunt work. <laughs> People recognized him right away and associated him with the part of Master Ken. And he used to get a big kick out of, uh, of uh, going up and talking to the kids that came in, and, and he'd have a couple of pebbles in his hand that he reached out from the, uh, from the flower pots, and he could take these pebbles from my hand. It's time for you to leave. You know? <laughs> I actually had to eat rabbit for, uh, for a scene uh, during the night shoot, and I had to eat I don't know how many rabbits. It was, it was while I was trying to catch the coin as well. Uh, I'd have to take a bite and then catch the coin. And they had a bunch of rabbits, and it was real rabbit. And I ate, and I would eat and eat, and I'd never catch that damn thing, because I couldn't see it coming out of the dark. Hieronymus Perra was, was the most victimized child in the history of television. A friend of mine who was a, a boom operator, uh, Marvin Lewis, 
Marvin said that he's standing up on the boom one day and he's got the mic out there and, and Rodimus lets, starts letting some, some tension out and starts ha ah, yelling and ha ah, and Marvin's got these headphones on and it's just like knives through his skull. And Marvin says, you know, one more time Rodimus and we're gonna get into this. And sure enough, bah, you know, a few minutes later, Marvin takes the cans off, gets down from the boom, walks over to Radimus, picks him up physically, and throws him in the swimming pool. It was a happy set. They talk about this incredible sense of, of camaraderie and teamwork that existed. That was very evident on Kung Fu. I remember the first day of filming, you know, we drove in from Oxnard. I think I was with my grandmother, who, was, who drove me down that day, and no David. About 45 minutes later, this beat up rust bucket of a, like a 1949 Studebaker convertible rolls up in a cloud of dust, a uh, couple of dogs in it. David gets out barefooted, pretty much in wardrobe already. You know, that jacket, that hat, and cupping a small green cigarette, I thought. And he just kind of looked around and was like, okay, what, what are we doing? The incident that we all remember best was him coming in for maybe the fourth day of a seven or eight day episode, and he had shaved his head the night before. I said, David, why did you do this? I think that's what Kane would have done. I said, but we have three days of shooting with hair on your head. I mean, we can't match anything. Oh, you'll figure it out. I mean, I, it was like <laughs> you're punching a pillow. The flip side of that was he was the character. He was absolutely perfect for the role. I mean, I believed him. The audience believed him. So there's always a, a yin and a yang, as we would say on the show. There is a lot to be said for going out on top. Hey, that's another thing. I stopped before I screwed up my brains, you know. And I don't mean from getting hit. I mean, being the star of a television series can turn you into a, you know, a fat, drunk, uh, lost hulk of a person. I've seen it happen to a few people. He was burned out. There's no question about it. David was in almost every scene. The nature of that show was man-killing. I mean, we had nothing to cut away to, but uh, there was no subplot. So David was on screen all of the time. What a credit to David that he worked that hard every day, every day, every day, no matter what. When I walked off the show, um, I, I had the undying anger of the network and the studio. I think up to this day, the studio is still really teed off at me for walking off. I mean, you know, how, how many people walk away from a hit show? Even if he had wanted to, it, contractually he couldn't have. I mean, you just, you work those things out. No, he didn't, it, it really was a, just a matter of audience decline. I think the, some of the poetic nature of the writing changed uh, and, and the nature of the flashbacks changed in the stylized way in which they were written and shot. Um, it was still a good show, but I think it was just a slightly different show. When the show went on the air, it, it was pretty much of an instant hit. It, it did really well. Unfortunately, the ABC schedule was so weak. I think that this first time slot was after Streets of San Francisco, which was one of their few hits. And then they moved it, I think, to Friday night or Saturday night. And now the audience started dropping, because any network executive will tell you the way to kill a show is to move it. The audience just doesn't follow it. And that's why people remember the show very well. What they don't remember is it only ran about two, two and a half years. With almost no exceptions, well, very few exceptions, moving a show from where it be had become established is the death knell. You can hear the chime on the gong as soon as you premiere on the first new night, regardless of how many horns are blown and how many drums are pounded, it still is the beginning of the end. Is it good to seek the past, Master Poe? To 
Does it not rob the present? If a man dwells on the past, then he robs the present. But if a man ignores the past, he may rob the future. The seeds of our destiny are nurtured by the roots of our past. So that, you know, little New Yorker, Ed Spielman, who had, you know, taken a few classes in Kung Fu and wrote a script about it, a very fantasy script, was the cause of the entire martial arts explosion, if you remember. Because of the Bruce Lee movies, Chuck Norris got into the mix, and then everybody else really who came along after that was derived either from the series or from Bruce Lee's career or from both. I think it was unique in that uh, it was a soothing wisdom that they departed onto the audience. And I think this is what really uh, sold. Everybody remembers the wisdom. I really think that the early 70s were, were a golden age of television and Kung Fu stood out uh, kind of on the top of, uh, or at least uh, uh, in the upper echelons of television because of its, because of the style of the show. It was so different from anything on the air. It would, if it were on the air today, it would, it would be very different. And last weekend, coincidentally, on a golf course, my pals and I wound up playing with this kid who was like 15 years old. And he said, I'd never heard this one before. He said, oh, my grandfather still talks about that show. I was grandfather. Oh, yeah, he's my age. Shit. <laughs> so somehow it just um, it stuck around with the culture. It was a rarity in television. There were many other shows since then, I think that, and there may have even been a few before then, that had good ideas and exposed people to lessons of life. But none of them, I don't think, did it in quite the way uh, that, that, that Kung Fu did. And, and the character of Kwai Chang Kane is an archetype now in the culture. It's the, it's the, it's the searcher. It strikes a profound chord in people, and because of that, um, it has the power and the longevity that it has had. It gives you something to think about and you want to go back and think about it some more and it's a world that you don't know but you want to know more about. We had a, we had material which I thought was classical in its elements and our job was to bring them to light. It provided and it fed a need. Uh, beyond the fact that it was brilliantly written, directed, created, acted, performed, executed. I had uh, many, many, literally hundreds of phone calls and probably thousands of letters from viewers who, who asked more or less the same question. They, they, would, they would say flattering things about the show and they would say, can you tell me the book where these sayings are taken from because I'd like to raise my children this way. I'll never forget getting a letter from a school teacher. The note said, Thank you so much for doing this show. You have proved to my students, she, te she was a sixth grade teacher, you have proved to my students that you don't need to carry a weapon to be a man. Why does it have such longevity? This is an everyman story, this is a morality play. It's eternal. It's as old as something out of the Bible. And it, it has echoes of mythology. There's a magic in that show. More than any other TV show in the history of television.